I'm Guillaume Natural here, host of the E-Commerce Wizards podcast, where we feature top leaders in business and e-commerce. Today's guest is Kevin Hillstrom, CEO of Mind That Data. So uh, Kevin uh, uses first-party data, so your own data, to understand how customer habits changes. So his mission is to help CEOs understand how customers interact with advertising, product, brands, and channels. So Kevin runs a very prolific blog at blog.mind.data.com with over 4,400 blog posts, which is quite impressive, amazing, uh, productivity, Kevin. And uh, today we're going to be talking about the impact of COVID. So um, how consumer behavior is changing after COVID, how to capitalize on the e-commerce gains made during COVID, and how to not lose that edge. So before we get started, we have a sponsorship message. This episode is brought to you by Mage Montreal. If a business wants a powerful e-commerce online store that will increase their sales, or to move piled up dormant inventory to free up cash reserves, or to automate business processes to gain efficiency and re reduce human processing errors, our company, Mage Montreal, can do that. We've been helping e-commerce stores for over a decade, Here's a catch. We're specialized and only work on the Adobe Magento platform. We do everything Magento. If you know someone who needs design, development, maintenance, training, support, we got their back. Email our team, support at magemontreal.com or go to magemontreal.com. That's M-A-G-E, montreal.com. All right. Well, Kevin, thanks for being here today. Happy to be here. Thank you. Can uh, you tell us a little bit about yourself before we dive into the main topic? So... My name is Kevin Hillstrom. I spent my formative years working in retail at Land's End, Eddie Bauer, and Nordstrom. And for the past 15 years, I have had my own consultancy. I've worked with about 250 different clients. They span range from e-commerce startups to retail stores to old school catalog brands. And um, most of my work over the last couple of years has really focused on how companies develop new customers, bring them in, and actually get them to become loyal customers over time. So a lot of the work that I've been doing is really focused on that process that a customer takes over a several year period of time. And I work with um, CEOs and executive teams to really help them understand that process and then spend their advertising dollars wisely so that they have a loyal customer base in the future. Awesome. All right. Thank you, Kevin. So let's get straight into it. What are your observations with COVID? How are things changing? So there, there's been like three phases that I have seen um, over the course of the last year and a half. So when um, we go back a year and a half ago to March when the pandemic started, most of my e-commerce clients, well, as we got into April and May, saw gigantic increases in sales potential. So for instance, I have one client that had a $20 million business. And on an annualized basis, they went to $35 million within a couple of months. They started generating huge sales increases. When I would go back and look at what caused those sales increases, I would typically see that these companies were generating a ton of new customers that they wouldn't have generated otherwise. So COVID really changed the customer base of the clients that I worked with. A big time, so like, big time. Yeah. I, I can really like back you up on this. That like I had some client going from let's say twenty orders a day to four hundred orders a day, like massive changes. And this was with the lockdown, all kind of commodities or products that you could just not get the traditional ways. And like uh, online orders were just like exploding. Yes, and so that that happened with, with the exception of apparel. That pretty much happened across the board for my client base. And so last year in 2020, when you went through April, May, June, July, August, that time frame, my clients thrived. When you got in towards September through December of last year, you now bring on this huge glut of customers, and those customers start to spend money. So in addition to having all these new customers, you now had all these customers who had placed a first order or a second order who were buying. So you, it's like you had this compound interest that was happening. And so a lot of my clients started to see a slowdown in new customers, but at the same time, all the new customers they had acquired were spending money. And so the multiplication of that was their businesses were thriving. So during the second phase that went until about uh, February or March of 2021, my clients were ex experiencing all these sales increases and were very happy. A third phase then started really in spring of 2021. So all the customers who were going to repurchase, repurchased pretty fast. And they started to become loyal customers. 
this huge glut of COVID customers then that did not buy a second time. They got their need met during COVID. They started to slump and fall through what I call the customer file. So think about it this way. A, a customer buys for the first time. They are very responsive. And then each month that passes that they don't buy, they become less and less responsive. And so now today we have, most of my clients have customers who haven't bought in 17 or 18 months and they're really inactive. And so they've lost all the potential from those customers now. And so that is a trend that is, is really a struggle for a lot of my clients because the number of new customers have slowed back down to 2019 levels. And most of the customers acquired through COVID have aged now and are not buying anymore. And so it's kind of back to business as usual for a lot of my clients. When I analyze my client base, I'm seeing that sales are decreasing. They're still better than they were two years ago, but they are decreasing now. And combine that with a lot of product availability issues because a lot of the product that my clients want to sell is sitting on ships off of Long Beach, California. And they can't bring it in. We're in a phase now where the customers who are buying are being disappointed because products aren't available. So it's kind of a weird dynamic that happened where there was this huge positive, and now there's starting to be struggles that my clients are having. Um, very interesting. So you're saying people pretty much got their, their, their needs met. So the early COVID customers, some became loyal customers, some just faded off, or some countries also eased out restriction, and, and you can again, go buy to your usual supplier, you can go back again to the hair salon, for example, that for a while was closed because of COVID restriction. And of course, ladies wanting their, their hair products or whatever would buy it online instead of from the hair salon directly. So um, yeah, it changes where they buy their, their stuff. Yes. Um, okay. And, and now product availability is an interesting discussion to have. Like there are some... Uh, perhaps justify, perhaps scaremongering going on right now about uh, if you want Christmas presents, you better buy early, you know, because there's likely some shortages of about everything coming up uh, for, for Christmas. Yes. So there is, um, my, my clients are telling me that it, it, it may not be as dire as the media reports it to be, but there are going to be product availability issues and they are having a lot of challenges getting product over here. I'm, I'm being told of Issues where they're told that their product is on a ship, and as soon as that ship leaves from China, that um, they're being told they say they have to they have to pay more to have the ship come over. So they're kind of being extorted a little bit. And then when the ship does arrive in California or in Tacoma, Washington, it basically sits off the shore because there's not enough resources to bring in all the containers and then deliver all the containers. So th this is now manifesting itself in the customer data I analyze. So when I'm analyzing customer data, I can look to see if a customer ordered an item, but that item was not available. And so the item got canceled. And I can see what impact that has on customer behavior going forward. And so far, the results are not dire from a customer standpoint. So what I'm seeing in my data is that customers, when they are disappointed because the product is not available, they are finding a substitute product and they're buying that from my clients. So in the short term, I think that's a big positive right now that customers are being pretty resourceful. If this were to continue for six months or a year, that dynamic may change. Right. And if we um, go back, let's say, to trying to, to keep that edge that some co a company gained during COVID or that boom uh, during COVID, like what would be your advice? Most of my clients had a very similar pattern that I saw in, revealed in the data. Um, so what, what happened is when a customer bought for the first time, that customer was incredibly responsive for anywhere between four weeks and 12 weeks after a first purchase. So I call this the welcome period. It's a time when my clients should probably have a different email marketing cadence for the first time buyers. They should probably present different merchandise online to customers based on what they bought in the first order. You, you basically have to really treat that customer well in those first four to 12 weeks after the customer purchases. Many of my clients still have new customer gains today that are higher than they were two years ago before COVID started. And that being the case, you really have to treat these customers well in those first 30 to 90 days. When a customer then does not buy after 30 to 90 days, the data seems to show that customers fade away for a while. So in other words, they, they become unresponsive. And so that is where you leverage everything that you have from a marketing standpoint that is free and not expensive. 
to try and keep those customers interested in your brand. They don't have to buy something, but they should stay interested. The data that I'm analyzing shows that when the customer gets to about 11 months after a first purchase, the customer starts to become very responsive again for about two months. So what happens is those customers have a seasonality associated with their purchase. I had lots of clients last year in April that were buying stuff for their garden because they were stuck at home. And so they were planting gardens. The following April, April, 2021, a lot of those COVID customers came back and bought again because it was the following April and they were doing things for their gardens. again. So that seasonality, I tend to see across the majority of my clients that when a customer who hasn't bought in 10 or 11 months gets to that one year anniversary, they become responsive again. So a lot of my clients work hard to try and capture that customer in that anniversary period. If that customer doesn't buy after that, that customer generally fades away and you don't see the customer anymore. Have you noticed anything about those products being more like a consumable rather than when you say gardening thing, you don't need to buy new gardening tools or a new set of tools every year, but you'll need the new seeds and so on. So is there some link there? there there's definitely some link there, but based on the type of product, yes. And so what, so what a lot of my clients do is they have seasonal product and then they complement that with products during the rest of the year that you can buy during the rest of the year. So what they're trying to do then is capture purchases in the non-seasonal periods, and then they use the seasonal products to basically hit the customer on the anniversary of their order to get purchases that way. And when we're not in season, is there any uh, winning move or best practice that you've uh, observed? I have observed, I, I have a client, for instance, that sells gifts. And so they do 40%, 40 of their business in November and December every year around Christmas. What they have found is they try to keep customers interested during the rest of the year. So they, they, they tell stories and they, they, they prepare the customer to get them excited for the next year's November and December. And what they have found is if they can get a customer to click through an email campaign and shop, just you know, basically look at the website twice a year during those off-season periods, that those customers are about 50% more responsive the following Christmas period. So it's really just a matter of keeping the customer interested during those off periods and having something to say to them that keeps them coming back to you. That's that's fun thing uh, to know to be able to like predict your sales or to to put it as a marketing objective. Try to uh, re-engage your customer in the off season at least twice. If you see them yes. clicking an email, clicking, clicking something, then 50% more likely to actually buy it from you again at the next holiday. That they'll they'll still remember you exist a year later. <laughs> Yes. And so I, so I use regression models where I try to control for other factors. And after controlling for the other factors, the email click-throughs cause you to be 50% more responsive in the future. So that's, it, it, it's I, by controlling for other factors, I know that the email tactic in this one example is, is useful. Any other like uh, gold nuggets like this that you've discovered, uh, you know, working your data? So there are things that I, I look at when a customer buys for the first time, there are issues, or not issues, there are attributes that the customer possesses that tells you who is going to come back and who does not come back. So I'm, I'm working right now on a, on a project where when a customer buys for the first time, what they buy, in other words, if they buy from a certain merchandise category that lends to repeat behavior, If they buy from a certain marketing channel, so for instance, if they buy from Amazon, that's bad. If they're buying from paid search, that's good. Um, if, it, if they buy multiple items in their order versus one item, if they buy expensive items versus inexpensive items, if they buy items at full price versus items that are a discount, if you have multiples of those good things, the customer has about a 58% chance to come back in this project I'm working on. If they do the bad things, buying one item, buying an inexpensive item, buying an item that's 50% off, buying from merchandise categories that do not lend to repeat behavior, those customers had a 28% chance of coming back. So what you can do in the case of this client is they score every new customer that comes into their business. And when that customer buys for the first time, they get put into a path. They're either going to be the high value path, average or low value path. And the high value customers get treated differently. And so the low value customers basically get treated with a lot of what I would call free marketing tactics. They don't spend money on those customers. So understanding what a customer does in a first order 
tells you how likely you are to have good customers going forward. Also, by doing the scoring, this client is able to look at first-time buyers and they can see when they're going to have future sales problems. Because if they buy, if, if they get a bunch of customers from Amazon, for instance, that have low value, the reporting tells them that they're going to have problems in the future. And so they adjust their marketing mix to constantly try and bring in customers that have higher value in the future. Right. So just to be sure I heard correctly one part here. So the high value uh, path, customers on that high value path, you will actually send them more marketing that is free, uh, free stuff uh, or inexpensive, maybe report PDF, white paper studies, that kind of stuff. If a customer is going to be high value, um, Mike, this client in particular is actually willing to spend more money on those customers. If the customer is low value, that's where they would do all the inexpensive free stuff with that customer. Right. Okay. Okay. And I guess it depends from which business, what kind of what's the price tag on each of your uh, of your items. But have you can you give some examples of, of like tactic specifics of what are those freebies that people give away? Because of course, if you're a B two B, you might send uh, white papers, case studies, that kind of stuff. But that's not applicable if you're a B two C. Like, what do you see uh, going on as a way to keep people engaged like this? So uh, on a high value path, you may get some pretty hard sells in, in your marketing messaging. So for instance, one of my clients would have um, courses that they sell. And um, those courses might cost $499. The high value path is going to get a marketing mix in that first 30 days to encourage that customer to cross shop into other courses and spend $499 quickly. The low value customer who's kind of just you know, browsing and they, they bought something for $89 and you can kind of tell they're kind of one and done, they're going to go down an educational path. So they're going to have a, a marketing mix that basically is just teaching them about the brand and what the brand does. And it's all educational. The other path is going to be hard sell. They're going to do outbound marketing. They're going to have, um, they, they will assign a sales rep to that customer if it's a high value customer. And that, that sales rep is going to have communications with the customer. So you're just basically spending money on the people who have the best chance of coming back and you're trying to cross sell them. The customers who are not coming back, that's where a white paper might be offered. That's where you might refer them to the company blog and, to, and ask them to subscribe to the blog and read about what's happening. Different selling techniques for different audiences. Yeah, yeah that, that makes a lot more sense to me. But I, the other technique could have made sense also if it's a low a price item that even your high customers will spend just a few dollars each, but maybe in a repeat cycle throughout the year and you have uh, tens of thousands of customers and millions of customers. Okay. Uh, yeah, I like that. All right, cool. So this is really uh, interesting, actually. It's really useful because as a business owner, you want to have some visibility and prediction as for your, your sales, and you want to spend your marketing dollar in the right place. So if you know who's a likely high value, medium, or low value, changing your marketing mix, changing where you spend your time, uh, that you don't, uh, not cold call, but phone call, let's say every single person, the whole customer list when they have tens and tens of thousands of customers, and save a lot of time where to put your effort. Oh, I, I really like that. Yeah. Um, okay, so um, anything else that you've observed from uh, you know behaviors and changes from, from COVID or uh, how to capitalize on this? I have, I have not observed a change in the path that customers take from, become, from a first-time buyer to becoming loyal as a result of COVID. One of the things that's been interesting is there was this clear COVID bump that lasted three or four months at the start of the pandemic when customers were generally across the board were very responsive and they're kind of trapped at home. And so those were really good times for e-commerce. Since then, customers have largely reverted back to their 2019 behavior. And so what happens is for most of my clients is they acquire a glut of customers, a huge number of new customers, a small number of them place a second order. Of those people, half will place a third order. And it takes about five purchases before the customer becomes what I call loyal. Um, when a customer becomes loyal, they have at least a 60% chance of buying again in the next year. And they tend to order frequently if they do buy. And so all the profit is for the business is generated from those customers. The path to get from first purchase to loyal status has not really been altered by COVID. 
and it is an incredibly long and hard path for a customer to get to. So what I've found is that my clients that have the most success generally are really good at acquiring customers and are really good at converting those customers to a second purchase quickly. And that time frame is when you can affect the largest number of customers. If you have a loyalty program to cater to your best customers, it's a small number of customers. It can have good financial benefit, but you don't really change the dynamics of your business. So COVID has not impacted how customers are evolving from a first purchase to loyal status. That process has remained largely the same, and it's a long, hard process for the customer to go through. And let's say if a company puts that forward as an objective, say, okay, let's try to get more loyal customer. Um, sounds good on paper. Um, you know, what would be the recommendation here? You try to get them to like five purchases or something like that. I guess you would uh, perhaps readjust that number five based on the industry and the type of product sold or, and uh, what else would you do other than say, the, the low, medium, high value pad for the marketing mix? So my, most of my clients, what they do when they want to talk about having a loyal customer base is they go and find all the customers who are loyal already, and they try to make them more loyal. And so that process doesn't result in you having more loyal customers. So what I found with my clients is the ones who are good at having a loyal customer base focus all their marketing efforts on customer acquisition and the process of going from a first purchase to a second purchase. And so what happens is if you can increase the number of customers who go from a first purchase to a second purchase by 30%, you will likely increase the number of loyal buyers in two years by about 15 or 20%. So there's this lag. And it's if you do your marketing activities well with all of your new customers and first and second time buyers, if you do that well today, you will have a loyal customer base in two years that is much bigger and more profitable. Makes a lot of sense. Okay, so you just just work at the root, at the foundation of it. Yes. How many new customers buy a second time? Let's, let's just like target that really hard, measure that, increase that. And of course, the rest will follow that many of them will actually buy a third time as well and so on. Correct. Very interesting. Very uh, Because th this gives focus again, because very often a merchant, a business owner can do almost anything there, but uh, he needs to know what to focus on. So this is yeah. this is giving a clear direction. Okay, we're going to focus on increasing the number of second time buyers. Yeah, yeah. And if you and, and it's an easily measurable goal, right? So um, for many of my clients, about 30% of first time buyers will purchase for a second time. And so what we do is we say, we're going to change that number from 30%. This year, we'll change it from 30 to 35%. That is a very hard goal to achieve. It is incredibly hard to go from 30% of first-time buyers buying again to 35%. However, that 5% increase results in enough customers that two years from now, your number of loyal customers increases at a fast rate. And then those customers generate a lot of profit downstream. So I try to get my clients to focus on that window and trying to get them to change their marketing tactics so that two years from now, they will have more loyal customers. Very, uh, very interesting. I call those gold nuggets. <laughs> I like this stuff. Very good. Okay. Um, anything else that comes to mind that uh, would help merchants and how they target their customers? From a merchandising standpoint, what you sell goes a long way towards determining if you're going to have a loyal customer base. So if, if um, I, I have clients that uh, are in retail malls, for instance, and if they sell boring products that customers generally don't need and they sell them at a significant discount like 40% off, you are going to attract a customer who in the future is only going to buy boring products at 40% off. And so you get yourself stuck in a cycle that is really painful. Okay. I have one client that um, they sell a dress shirt and they sell the dress shirt. It's a $24.95 dress shirt. So it's, it's sold very inexpensively. They basically break even on the sale of this item. And they build their whole marketing campaign around that item. And that item, they've done the research. And that item causes customers to buy other from other product categories in the future. So if you buy the dress shirt, you're, uh, uh, you may need a tie in the future. You may need dress shoes. You may need slacks. You may need a suit. You may need to complement this item. And so they have found that that item causes them to acquire customers who in the future are going to do lots of things. So from a merchandising standpoint, 
you can research for every item that you sell. You can look to see in the future if those customers who buy those items exhibit cross shopping across lots of categories. And there are specific items that you sell that encourage that behavior. Every company has those. And I would say when a customer visits your website, if you recognize that that customer has never purchased from you before, you should try and feature the merchandise that causes customers to be likely to buy and then do lots of things positively in the future. So the assortment that you are showing the customer should be a little bit different than what you show other customers. Okay, so it's a bit the concept of the loss leader, but it's not a loss, it's a break even. It's yeah. the shirt, and they've sort of proven that when you buy a shirt from us, if you're a returning customer, maybe next time you need a suit and other more expensive stuff or just other stuff in general. Sure. Okay, so that's that's interesting. It can be scary also for a merchant when they do that break even technique that they'll be acquiring the equivalent of that 40% off kind of customer that then they'll never be able to sell them the, the full retail price on other stuff, or will that they actually come back for? For other things, or uh, yes, do, do you see that a bit as a bit of a risk when you you put forward one product as sort of the the break even and low point price point product? I think as long as you limit the damage to one item or a small number of items, you are okay. So what I have found is my when my clients discount the whole assortment and it's forty percent off everything this week only, or it's Cyber Monday fifty percent off. Those are dangerous tactics. If you focus on something small so that you're so that the, the customer buys something else, they're paying full price for something else, then you don't tarnish whatever it is that you're doing with that one item. So I, I my clients that have success tend to focus on something small and then they hype that one thing trying to get the customer to buy then multiple other products in that first purchase. Right. And uh, does that also apply to, let's say, some kind of a discount category or section? We may see this a lot on the e-commerce website that they have one like liquidation section, but the rest of the store is, let's say, a premium store, but this is major discounts. That is a, um, how best to say this? Liquidations are a necessity, and so you have to do it. Um, what you're trying to do is two things with liquidations. You are trying to limit the number of times a customer buys liquidated merchandise, or if the customer buys that frequently, you go ahead and let the customer go down that path. And you set, you kind of try to separate out the rest of the customer base. So now you basically have two customer bases, the one that likes off-price merchandise and the one that likes full-price merchandise. What you don't, don't want is you don't want the full-price crowd to slowly leak into the off-price stuff and that you eventually have no full-price customers left. You want to have as many pure full-price customers as possible give, given, given the liquidation strategy you have to employ. Which, which seems like a, a business challenge or risk here to say, like, how do you prevent that leak from regular customer going, let's say, from the retail store to the outlet store kind of thing? You yes. Um, yes. And, and so in your marketing communications, you do not try to feature the off-price stuff. You're, you're trying to constantly reinforce that you are worth selling a widget at $100, and that is $100 is a fair price. And you are constantly reinforcing that message from a marketing standpoint. For the 15% of your customer base that wants off-price, you make it available to them. But you're really trying to constantly push the high price stuff. I have a client that you could, there was a day when a new marketing team came in in 2014, if I remember correctly. And that new marketing team said, we're going to use email marketing to push all the off price and liquidations activity. And you could see within a couple of months that those email customers who were getting five marketing messages per week had changed their behavior. And they went from buying items that cost $51 on average to buying items that cost $45 on average. And when they bought items that were $45 on average, in the future, they would buy more inexpensive items, items that were $35 or $40. And you could just see those customers because of the marketing message changing their behavior. And so you, you want to mitigate that change in behavior. So this company was never able to go back. Once they let that happen, they couldn't go back and sell at full price because they had trained their entire email database, which was 40% of their customer file. They changed, they treated, or I'm they taught them 
to buy inexpensive stuff. You almost want to start a new marketing segment and new marketing message and then put all your new subscription into that new segment to try to rebuild what you've lost with your marketing team. But basically, they went for short-term profit and then they, they damaged the brand and the client base. Yes, I agree with that. Yeah, okay. Well, that, So that's another gold nugget here. So don't push your liquidation stuff through your marketing emails and so on, just make it available on the website if you find it, or you can have a specific kind of loss leader or break-even leader in, in the full price section. And then you don't you don't offer a full uh, discounted section, just one specific item that is like an amazing deal in this high-end store, to drive uh, traffic, web traffic or foot traffic, that place. Correct. Okay. Very good. So um, any uh, last gold nugget that comes to mind like this? Uh, I think the, the, the best way to describe what I encourage my clients to do is to shift their focus a little bit from most of my clients are focusing on marketing channels. In other words, they're going to pay Facebook X dollars and they're going to get what number of customers, you know, a certain number of new customers, Y new customers, right? And they kind of view it as a transaction. And there are another a large number of people that would I would compete with in my job who would say, no, you have to focus on the customer and you have to focus on the you know a personalized approach to each customer and make sure you're taking care of the customers. I don't subscribe to either of those processes, though I think both can be very successful. So for me, I like to shift the thinking of I have customer, I, I, I have audiences. Okay, I have a prospect audience. I have first customers, first time buyers, and I'm going to welcome them. I call that the welcome process. When a customer buys for a second, third, or fourth time, I call that emergence. The customer is emerging from where they started to becoming a loyal customer. I then have loyal customers. And it's been my experience across my client base that loyal customers don't stay loyal. Customers are always in a state of decay. It's it, a loyal customer is kind of like a five-year-old car you own. That car has been fabulous to you and you are loyal to that car and that car is wonderful, but that car is always going to break down and need repairs. And eventually that car is not going to be acceptable anymore and you're going to throw it out or, or sell it and get a new car. So custom, loyal customers are like that. They've treated you well, but you are all, the end goal is not to have loyal customers because loyal customers disappear eventually. And then they, those customers become what I call retired or lapsed. They're, they, they don't buy from you anymore. And you have to start, if you're going to market to them, you basically do free, inexpensive marketing and you don't spend money on them. And so what I try to teach is this continuum. And that a marketing executive should have every, everything they do should fit somewhere in that continuum. And then the reporting should show how well you do at moving customers through that continuum. So if you're going to do a campaign on Facebook and you find that that campaign caused 500 purchases, of those 500 purchases, 400 of them were first-time buyers, you know that that is part of your um, awareness or acquisition area of marketing. And so that those campaigns go into that bucket. And when you're doing those campaigns, that's the thought process you're going through is that's who I'm trying to bring into the business now. When you do... Email marketing, for instance, you are largely talking to customers who are better. And so the marketing message to those people is just fundamentally different. And I'm trying to basically get my clients to focus on this continuum. And, it's, and, and, and their campaign should fit into the continuum. Their personalization efforts should fit somewhere in that continuum. And everything should have a reason for being within that continuum. Okay. And, uh, and I really like what you're saying. And there's one more thing that makes me think about. So we're talking a lot about high volume uh, large businesses and so on. Like, how does that change if we're talking a different kind of business? Uh, just for example's sake, let's pretend it's like a Ferrari dealership or something like this. So you have a very small volume of purchases, but each one is a major purchase, like whatever, $350,000, whatever the price is, I didn't check. Um, so how do you handle something like that? Because then you have very few samples of data to do like analytics and, and statistics. So from my standpoint, your analysis window changes. So in other words, if you buy a Ferrari, you may buy another Ferrari in three or four years. Three or four years becomes a three or four month win window in when I have an apparel client, that customer's first purchase happens within 
The second purchase happens within 30 to 90 days after a first purchase. For the Ferrari, it might mean that the next purchase happens three to five years later. So you extend the welcome period considerably. And the welcome period then is that car is going to be under a warranty. So your job is to get the customer to come in and get their first oil change for free or whatever that is, and to get those checkups and that you don't want that customer going somewhere else for service. So your communications are going to be about what it is, the reasons why that customer should take their car to you every four months for an oil change and what the customer gets out of that or how you're going to treat the customer well so that the customer continues those habits. And remember earlier, I talked about a client where they, they sold gifts during Christmas. And so their job was to get the customer to click through an email campaign twice a year during the non-Christmas period. The same thing happens for a Ferrari dealership. You want that customer to interact with you maybe a couple of times a year. And so you're trying to do those things. And you're, you just, your window extends. It is not a short 30 to 90 day window. It's a long three to four year window. Very interesting. And the rest sort of stays the same, basically, but you just stretch it to four or five years instead of uh, being just a few months. Yes, you, you stretch the window out. Okay, cool. Um, coming pretty close to the, uh, the end of our recording time, do you have any uh, last idea um, that could help merchants? Um, I, I am really optimistic right now about, um, in particular, e-commerce merchants. That um, How best to say this? There, you know, when I started in retail in 1990, retail was, in my opinion, really boring. And it was set in stone and it, it, you had a process in place and it was very hard to change things. And then when e-commerce came along for the first 10 years or so, you were, e-commerce professionals were building something from nothing. And so that was a different kind of fun, right? So, so it's, it's fun to build a website and it's fun to execute marketing programs you could never execute before and to read results that you could never see so it was a time of exploration and excitement that way. To me, the next five years are really about um, creating slightly different business models. Given what COVID has done to our society, it's almost like you're starting with a new, you know, a, a clean piece of paper. and You're getting to redesign things that you wouldn't have gotten the opportunity to do otherwise. So for many of my e-commerce clients, they have a lot of profit they generated in the past two years that they wouldn't have had otherwise. They have money to invest. And that money can be invested then in either new products or new marketing strategies or new brands, whatever you want to do. There is a window here now for the next two to five years where you get to do things you wouldn't have done otherwise because you have the money available to do it. And if I was an e-commerce professional, I would be really excited about that. And I would be taking advantage of changes in customer behavior. As, as, as more and more customers shop online, there's just going to be more and more opportunity to take the profit you get from your business and reinvest it in something neat and interesting. So I'm, I'm actually quite optimistic about where e-commerce can go. And I do think that over the next two to five years, sales are going to continue to leak from in-store purchasing into e-commerce. And it's going to be the job of e-commerce professionals to speed that process up and do new and interesting things with it. I think you, you've shared lots of gold nuggets here, uh, Kevin. Uh, thank you very much. If people want to get in touch with you, what's the best way to do this? Um, you can contact me on Twitter at MindThatData, M-I-N-E-T-H-A-T-D-A-T-A. -A -A. Um, my blog, where almost all of my customers interact with me, is blog.mindthatdata.com. And I post there five times a week. So that's a good place to see what I'm currently thinking about or what my current research topics are. Awesome. Well, thank you for being here today, Kevin. Well, thank you. This was fabulous. And I appreciate the opportunity.